It seems that uh, we are all ready now, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is my honor to participate in this panel organized by the International Plural Society, especially in this opening panel. I am Min Jun Ha, uh, currently working as a lecturer and a researcher in classical studies at Seoul National University. It is my pleasure to moderate this panel and introduce our speakers uh, who are uh, two young researchers from Europe and Asia, more particularly from Germany and South Korea. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction about our presenters. Uh, our first uh, speaker is Dr. Christoph Perch from uh, Heidelberg University. Uh, he, I think he's uh, here, I hope. Um, yes, okay. Thank yes, you. I am. Okay, Hello. Good. good morning. Good, good morning. afternoon. Okay. So welcome. And uh, he is the author of a very important and recent book entitled Platon's Philosophy des Bildes, uh, published in Germany and uh, many other articles on Plato's theory of image. The paper of Dr. Poch will be followed by the presentation of Dr. Uh, Su Jin Kim from Yonsei University. Dr. Kim is uh, an excellent specialist of Plato. She wrote, uh, she wrote a very important PhD thesis on Plato's, uh, Plato's Parmenides at University of Cologne. So she also studied uh, in Germany. Uh, she has also written important articles on uh, Plato's uh, metaphysics, and uh, she's, she is considered as uh, one of the best specialists of Plato in Korea. Uh, and for, for today's presentation, uh, as you know, each speaker is given uh, 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes. And at the end of each presentation, there will be a five to 10 minute uh, discuss discussion period. So without uh, uh, further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to give uh, his presentation. Please let's welcome Dr. Puch to the floor. Hello everybody, <laughs> thank you very much for the very kind introduction and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor and a great pleasure uh, being uh, with you today, this morning or this afternoon. I hope uh, my talk finds you all well and healthy. I think that's the most important thing these days. And thank you once more uh, very much for uh, having me. And I will try to share my screen with my presentation. I hope that works. Um, no, uh, it says that I'm not allowed to do so. The host uh, deactivated it for me. Uh, um, wait just a minute, please. Uh, I'm not the host, but uh, I will ask him to allow you to uh, show your, uh, your file. Okay. Uh, maybe we can start without, uh, now it's, po now okay, it's po possible now. It says now it's possible? Yes, now it's better. Let me see. Do you see something? Yes, yes, it works. Oh, okay, perfectly. I will try to. Thank you very much. Okay. So my paper is entitled um, Body, Soul, Form and Image, the relevance of the image for a detailed understanding, understanding of uh, Plato's ontology. Uh, Plato's ontology is most commonly regarded as a so-called two worlds ontology. According to this view, Plato's ontology is mainly based on a bipartite distinction between transcendent forms on the one hand and physical particulars on the other. In my talk, I want to argue that this bipartite uh, distinction is ultimately a bit too simple. By taking into account the concept of the image, I want to foster the view that Plato's ontological position is rather to be regarded as a tripartite constellation 
with the soul as a crucial intermediate step. My paper thereby follows a twofold aim. First, I want to show how the image helps to understand Plato's ontology in the sense of this tripartite view. And second, I would like to point out how this concept of the image provides a helpful link between Plato's ontology and his ethics. My argument will proceed in three steps. In the first step, it will concentrate on the dense passage 402 A to E in Book 3 of the Republic, which will be analyzed with regard to the image in the order to support the tripartite view. In the second step, I will very briefly offer another evidence from the Fido. Finally, I will return to the Republic to sketch how the image actually allows for a systematic link between Plato's ontology and his ethics. Before I start, let me briefly explain how I understand the heuristic difference between the bipartite and the tripartite view. According to the bipartite view, Plato's ontology basically consists of two levels, the transcendent immaterial forms and the physical particulars, which directly participate in the form. This is well known, I think. According to what I call the tripartite view, one has to further suppose the soul as an intermediate ontological level. Reality thus consists of the transcendent immaterial forms, the invisible soul, and the visible physical particulars. In this tripartite constellation, physical, uh, physical particulars do not directly participate in the forms, but do so only immediately via the level of the soul. Some might indeed argue that the tripartite constellation applies, if anywhere, only to Plato's light Plato's latest dialogues, since, for instance, the Timaeus calls soul a third kind of being, a tritus eidos tes usias in 34c. However, my argument will exclusively concentrate on the so-called middle dialogues, thereby holding the thesis that the tripartite constellation already applies to these. So let's move to the first step, the images of words and virtues, Republic 402a, a to e. The dense passage for the two A to E is situated within Socrates' discussion of the musical education of the guards. In this passage, Socrates tells us that we have to know some different things about the virtues before we fully master musicae techne and properly represent the different characters in art. The passage in total runs as follows, just to recall it. This is the uh, uh, translation of Emlyn Jones Pretty, it's uh, a bit modified. So I quote, then just with written, just as with written words, I said, we were competent at that point when the individual lettered, letters, few that they are, did not escape our notice in any of the words in which they are carried around, and we did not overlook them as we did not need to see them. But instead we were keen to distinguish them everywhere since we could not master grammatique until we were able to do so. That is true. And also with the images, with the images of the written words, if suppose they were reflected in waters and mirrors, we could not recognize them until we had learned themselves. Um, yes, certainly it is. Well then, I, as I said by the gods, isn't it the same with musique? That we shall not master musique until we are familiar with the forms of moderation, bravery, liberal mindedness, magnificence, which are carried around everywhere, and until we're conscious of them and their images as being in those things in which they are, don't we? End of quote. The general structure of Socrates' argument is we have to know A before we fully master B. In this case, we have to know some things about the aretai before we fully master musique. To explain this relation more vividly, Socrates uses an analogical comparison. Just as we have to know A before we fully master B, so we have to know C before we fully master D. In this case, Socrates compares the preconditions of musique to those required for mastering alphabetic writing just as we have to know A before we fully master grammatique, so we have to know C before we fully master musique. 
Let us first consider the preconditions we have to fulfill to become grammaticoi. First of all, Socrates tells us that we have to know the single letters, tastosheia, steia, themselves, and that we have to recognize that there are actually only very few. Secondly, we have to understand the basic principle of alphabetic scripture. That is, that there are only very few letters, but they appear everywhere in different combination, that means in different words. These letters are carried around in all different words, periferomena, as Socrates puts it. In this sense, the letters A and T, for instance, both appear in the word cat, while only T, but not A, appears in the word tree. And if I learn it correctly in preparing my talk, this is actually the same principle that underlies a Hangul, the, the Korean alphabet. The general alphabetic principle thus implies to discern the single letters as such from their integration in different words. Third to this, Socrates quite strangely reminds Glaucon that we also have to discern the images of the written words, hi iconis grammaton. This sounds quite odd, though it is in principle intelligible. Uh, we can actually understand the difference between a written word, let's say on papyrus, and its reflected image in a pond. This capability of distinguishing mirrored words from written ones is in fact not necessary to master the skill of writing, but it will turn out in a minute that Socrates introduces this difference for the sake of comparison. Let us instead turn now to the preconditions of musique on the other side of the analogical comparison. Corresponding to the first precondition in writing, we have to know the forms themselves of different aratai, such as moderation and bravery. These transcendence forms correspond to the single letters. Secondly, we have to recognize that also these virtues are carried around everywhere, pantahu periferomena. This means we have to apply the alphabetic principle to the realm of virtues. Actually, this works perfectly fine, since here again we find something analog to the words, the concrete souls of human individuals. These souls are indeed similar to concrete words in the very sense that each of them is a specific mixture and combination of present and absent virtues. Such as A and T were both present in cat, but T was only in tree, we could imagine that the virtue of bravery is both present in the souls of, let's say, Socrates and Nicias, while wisdom is only present in the soul of the former. Furthermore, the third precondition of discerning words and images also applies to this side of the comparison. Socrates tells us explicitly that in order to master musique, we have to be, I quote, conscious of the virtues and their images as being in those things in which they are. How do we make sense of that difference between images original and originals in this case? In my eyes, this statement is most easily explained by understanding the image as pointing to the human body. This is confirmed by the fact that Socrates recalls these two levels immediately after my initial quote at 402d. I quote, if for anyone there is a correspondence of the fine qualities in the soul agreeing and harmonizing with those in his physical form, since they both participate in the same type, this would be a very fine sight for anyone capable of seeing." End of quote. This passage clearly distinguishes between the soul and the body, and furthermore seems to allude to the form of virtue itself by the term tupos. And shortly afterwards, there's actually a second uh, quote, which katatem psychen and katatosoma again recalls this difference I'm uh, pointing to. To understand the difference between the virtues which are carried around and their images then means to understand the difference between the presence of a virtue in an individual's soul and its outer bodily appearance. This difference is again perfectly intelligible. Taking up the former examples, we may, for instance, suppose that in Nikia's soul, bravery is actually present 
while his outer appearance may remain sovereignly calm and focused, whereas Hotspur Alcibiades might only pretend being a brave warrior in his outer appearance, while in fact in his soul the virtue of bravery is actually absent. In the same sense, we could imagine that Soc Socrates' soul might actually embrace wisdom, while in his outer appearance he pretends ignorance. Whereas on the contrary, some Eutyphro, for instance, may appear very wise to some Athenians, while his particular soul in fact lacks the feature of wisdom. Discerning the virtues that are carried around and their images thus points to the difference between soul and body. And these two levels correspond clearly to their respective levels in the comparison of writing. This may in turn explain why Socrates, rather oddly, had introduced this difference in the first part of the comparison. In total, Socrates thus tells us that we need to clearly distinguish three levels in order to master musique. Firstly, the level of the transcendent form of virtue itself. Secondly, the level of the individual soul, which entails a concrete combination of present and absent virtues. And thirdly, the level of the body, which marks the outer central appearance. This seems to be, to me, a, a profound example of the tripartite view that includes the soul as an intermediate level. Most importantly, it is indispensable to clearly understand the systematic role of the image in this constellation to properly grasp its position on the level of the body in the tripartite structure of form, soul, and body. In fact, calling the human body an image is confirmed by Book 9 of the Republic, where Socrates, in his famous simile of the soul, explicitly calls the human body the image of the human being. This is 580 AD. Calling the body an image is thus another way to describing its function as a central display, so to speak, of the soul. Let us move to the second step, some further evidence for the tripartite view. I will now briefly name an instance from the Fido that provides, in my eyes, further evidence of the tripartite view. In explaining the, the theory of forms there in the Fido, Socrates tells us, I quote, I think it is evident not only that greatness itself will never be great and also small, but also that the greatness in us will never admit the small or allow itself to be exceeded." End of quote. Shortly afterwards, he adds that these two levels may not be confused with the level of tapragmata about which he had talked earlier. We said before that an opposite thing was generated from an opposite thing, pragma, whereas now we say that the opposite itself can never become its own opposite, neither in us nor in the essential nature, in physics. Due to reasons of time, I'm not able to analyze these passages in detail, but nevertheless, they seem to provide a remarkably similar tripartite structure. Again, we have, firstly, the form in itself, in this case, autotomegatos, greatness itself. Secondly, we have what Socrates calls to enhemin megatos, the greatness in us. And thirdly, there is the level of tapragmata, which elsewhere in the Phaedo, for example, 98c, 98c, and also in dialogues like the Cratylus, is used to name the things of physical reality. With regard to the difficult expression to enhemin megatos, I think we have to particularly keep in mind the setting of the Phaedo as a whole. It is surely one main aim of the dialogue to properly locate ourselves, not in our bodies, but in our souls, as for instance Socrates' remark at the very end proves, when he tells Crito that the latter may bury his body however he wants, since he's actually not able to bury Socrates himself, that is, his soul. Since we, Hermes, are primarily our souls, according to Plato, the term to enhemin megatos consequently describes the presence of the form of greatness in our souls, 
which may in turn then be displayed on the level of our bodies. Or our images if we use the term of the Republic. I think there is further evidence of the tripartite view, for instance, from the symposium, but however, I will now return to the Republic to ask whether this view allows for a systematic link between Plato's ontology and his ethics. So the third step, a systematic link between Plato's ontology and his ethics. As we have seen in the previous steps, the tripartite view not only allows discerning between forms and partic physical particulars as the bipartite view, but also allows for distinguishing between the features of the soul and the features of the body. This ontological difference seems to be clearly connected to the ethical aspects of the Republic. I will now finally name two instances of this connection. The first one appears pretty early in the second book, where we read the following. I quote, since therefore, as wise man revealed to me, appearance even ravishes truth and governs our happiness, I must devote myself entirely to appearance. As a frond and facade, I must sketch around myself a painted shadow of virtue. That means, if appearance beats truth, it were sufficient to draw a shadow image of virtue a skia graphia aretes around oneself in order to succeed and to live happily. This fits exactly to the examples I named Alcibiades and Eutypho in the first step. In both cases, there is actually no virtue present in their particular souls. However, they try to provide a skia graphia of these virtues on the level of their bodily images. And since human interaction, and particularly the, for, the political form of democracy, heavily depends on this level of sensual appearance, this is in fact of great importance to ethical questions in a broad sense. If true individual virtue is to be found in an individual soul, rather than in his or her body, and if according to Plato true virtue is ultimately based in the form of this virtue, then the ontology of the tripartite view is intrinsically linked to the ethical dimensions of the Republic. This is confirmed by my second example, taken from Plato's allegory of the cave, probably his most famous image, we had it already in the introduction this morning. When Socrates talks about the freed prisoner there who returns to the cave, he tells us that this former prisoner is, quote, he is forced to plead in the law courts or anywhere else about the shadows of justice or the statues whose shadows they are and dispute, it, dispute about it on the basis of how these things are understood by those who never had, have yet seen justice itself. This constellation not only confirms once more the tripartite constellation as such, since we have the actual form of justice itself, the statues and the shadows. It also provides another clear example of how ethics are connected to ontology. In order to fully understand and to adequately discuss ethical virtues, we have to be aware of three different levels, which by the way allows to interpret the different levels of the cave with regard to the passage from the first step. Firstly, the transcendent form itself outside the cave. Secondly, the virtues which are present in particular souls. These are represented by the carried agalmata inside the cave. And thirdly, the outer bodily appearance of these physical particular virtues, uh, pardon, of these particular virtues, which are represented by the shadows on the wall. These shadow images are thus once more in my eyes, the central bodily appearance. These images may have their direct archetype in the individual soul, but they may be also the result of mere pretending, as long as these images do not originate in true virtue of the soul. Thus, the ontology of the image is intrinsically linked to Plato's ethics. And this, in turn, is one important sense in which the image plays a crucial role in properly understanding Plato's ontology of form, soul, and body. So 
Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Poch. I'm sure that uh, the, this uh, wonderful presentation will arise a lot of questions. Um, uh, if you have a question, please click the uh, rise hand button on your right and uh, please turn on your microphone. Yes, uh, Dr. Noboru. Yes, uh, uh, well, thank you very much for a nice presentation. I'm uh, Noboru Notomi from Japan. And well, uh, you showed clearly uh, that some kind of tripartite schema is important. And uh, you, uh, but uh, I, I'm wondering whether the, the middle one should be called so because of shuke. Um, well, I'm a bit um, uh, um, uh, unhappy with uh, the, the calling it Seoul because Seoul, uh, for example, in the uh, Fido and the Republic, are changing. I mean, transforming. You know, from the uh, ignorance to the um, knowledge. So I, I think that uh, your ontologically tripartite scheme <laughs> is probably important to explain how soul moves uh, from the ignorance to knowledge. But the, the middle, you know, if you identify the, the middle stage as soul, uh, how can you um, explain transformation or change of the soul? So that is my question. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, indeed, that was uh, that's a, a, a big claim. I'm sure of that. And that there are much more uh, uh, questions to answer. Uh, in in calling the uh, intermediate level the soul, I'm not claiming that, of course, that the soul is um, is restricted uh, to this uh, to this uh, level of reality, so to speak. Uh, but instead, it's it just the other way around because the soul is that part of reality so to speak which is able to access all different levels on the one hand it is able to access um, the realm of physical particulars via isthesis and to actually access the realm of forms via let's call it no noesis however that works of course it's differently but in i think in both cases uh, soul is able actually to um, move about, uh, move uh, to transcend its own borders, so to speak. But that is a case of uh, an, an epistemological question. While uh, my point was that the soul itself is based in the middle, but it's actually able uh, to, to, uh, to get, uh, to, to reach the forms on the one hand epistemologically, but still it is different in a certain sense from the forms and from the physical particulars. I mean, the soul is for sure, you, you were absolutely right in pointing to the Fido because there the soul is actually very closely connected to the, um, to the, to the forms themselves. Nevertheless, in a certain sense, they must be in some kind different from them since if two souls both access the form of, I don't know, the, some, some form, the form of beauty or not that's difficult, the form of a tree, it, it must be something transcendent to both of them. So my claim was not to restrict the soul, uh, I don't know, caving it in in its own realm, but it's situated in the middle, but it's actually able to grasp the whole of reality in different uh, forms. But thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kraza, maybe? Thank you very much for your talk. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, kind of connected to the previous one. Um, I'm wondering whether you uh, would uh, you would want to claim that that the structure of the of Plato's ontology is only uh, has only three layers, or if you would. Uh, say okay, maybe there are more layers than uh, than only three. And uh, I'm thinking about the the forms in us. You 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 were mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that uh, that in Fido there are these uh, strange entities, forms in us, greatness in us, um, and I'm. I'm not sure whether you you want to claim that these forms in us are on the same ontological level as the soul, uh, or uh, whether they are something special, uh, something like the fourth um, ontological um, uh, realm. So, uh, 
Can you bit, uh, expand on this topic, whether you would claim that the, the ontological uh, structure is only tripartite or whether there is a room for uh, even more layers? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that that uh, again, it's a very helpful question. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, um, it, what I said it, it was kind of a sketch in in, in twenty minutes. And uh, your, your your question gives me the chance to to add one one more uh, little aspect of detail. Of course, if I'm claiming this uh, tree partition, uh, this is not uh, the, the the final word, or then then it's done. Of course, we have to then start to. Um, uh, evaluate how these different levels are have differences within themselves and are uh, differentiated more in detail of course that that is no question because still within the within the physical realm for example we might start a, a discussion uh, whether there is a difference between uh, solid objects and images for instance and so on but they, they are both visible so so they they have some kind of connection and some kind of difference and with with regard to the question of um, the, the forms in us, I would say my, my very short answer to that, that is, of course, they are not just simply identical, but I would uh, consider the soul as a kind of embracing structure that, how do you, how should you call it, the bearer of these forms, like the, the, the structure which is able to possess these forms and uh, try to explain with the, with the different virtues. Of course, if, if we say, okay, Socrates uh, is brave and he has the, the form of uh, bra uh, bravery in him, then of course his soul is not just simply identical with the, with the form of bravery in him, but it's, it's kind of, a, in a very rough sense, a part of it. And of course, you are right in a second sense that we have to differentiate much more. For example, if we take a look at, at the line, which is actually not three-parted, but uh, four-parted, it has four levels. But um, I have developed a, uh, in my book that was mentioned uh, very kindly in the beginning, I developed an, uh, an interpretation of the line, which is able to deal with the equality of the middle segments. And according to my interpretation, which would need some more time, it is the soul on both of these uh, middle sections, which is actually proved by the term taperihemas zoa, which seems to be quite an interesting term in Plato. So that would be again a, a question how the, the realm of the soul in that case is to be different, say what much more. So I'm completely okay with your with your claim that we have to add much more differentiation to that, especially if we come to that very, very difficult question yeah. of uh, um, these forms in us. Oh sorry. <laughs> Dr. Bunch, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, enough time for one short question. Um, maybe uh, Professor Christopher, uh, I cannot read your, I mean, uh, book. buckles. Yes, buckles, yes. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for the paper. Uh, just uh, some more clarification, like the last two questions. Uh, again, thinking about these forms in us in the Fido. Uh, particularly some of the other examples that are brought up are the three and the odd and fire and snow. Uh, and so thinking about uh, your, your claim that the soul is a uh, kind of uh, middle between forms and particulars, uh, I just want to uh, clarify as to whether it's an epistemological middle or whether it's ontological. And if it is ontological, then uh, is it only for things like the virtues that um, may be born or parts of the soul? Or do you think that the soul is also related somehow in um, inanimate objects like fire and snow, if there are forms in us of these? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for I think that the question about how it is ontological and how it is epistemological that was already um, uh, from in the first question. Um, I will stick to the, to the second uh, aspect. Um, that, that's of course an interesting question and I would not claim that this can be answered completely from the from the uh, point of the, of the middle dialogues. But I, if I think about that uh, in a sense more systematically, the one thing is, okay, we have these animated um, beings like you and me, for instance, and there it's clear, okay, we both have a soul, and there is a, the, the, the perfect place to, 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 for, for virtues to enter in that intermediate step. And if I look to the world, to fire or snow and so on, I think that the, the most um, 
easy, easiest way within the Platonic framework would be to think of the world soul, which in a sense pervades the whole cosmos. And then it would be to say, if there is, if there is a, um, I don't know, a fire somewhere, then soul in, in a sense pervades this place and then the, this immanent form must be in that place. Of course, that's only possible if soul is connected to Korah and that's why I was hesitating to, to uh, that's why I'm not claiming that this is possible to explain it already in the, um, in the middle dialogues. Nevertheless, I think one can argue that it's not excluded that Plato had at least some some general thought of a of a something like what he later calls the world solo psyche to pantos already in the middle dialogues. I think also with the with the, some passages from symposium and so on. One could argue, but I think that would be the the systematic uh, answer within the Platonic framework to deal with these questions. But I'm completely okay. fine with you that this is a very difficult and uh, a very difficult question. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, we may continue this discussion during our uh, break time. Um, so now uh, let's move to um, let's move on to our second speaker, Dr. Kim. Uh, Sujin, you have the floor. Dr. Suji Kim, uh, you have to turn on the the the. The, the turn on the, the micro. So, the Hamian Are, Mite, Mite, Venture. Have you, have you found the, the button? I'm sorry, we have a technical problem. Ah, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, In, uh, please, uh, you have to wait uh, one or two minutes. It seems that uh, it works from uh, time to time, but uh, not completely. I haven't uh, uh, prepared uh, for this uh, situation. Maybe, um, maybe, uh, um, maybe we have uh, five minutes to continue our uh, discussion about uh, the former presentation. Uh, Mr. Afshalom, um, do you want to ask your question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for your paper. That was really, really interesting. Um, I had a question. I had a question about the status, the ontological status of the virtues um, in the soul. So, um, and especially, I'm interested about the difference between an image and a shadow painting or a shadow image. Uh, 
uh, Equinos and, and Ski Eye. So one, one question that I had is that it seems that in at least some, some Platonic texts and in, in the Republic as well, it seems that the virtues are themselves images of the forms, right? So I'm especially thinking about the claim that the philosopher should have a paradigma uh, in their soul. And this paradigma should, this paradigm should have um, itself sort of like, uh, the philosopher here him, is himself an imitator of the virtues, right? But because he has a knowledge of the virtues, he's able to imitate them more accurately uh, in the world. So in this sense, it seems that the virtues and the souls are themselves images. And then I wonder whether these uh, shadow paintings are simply just imitations of the of the imitations. So this kind of like tries to remove from the truth. So I just wonder if you if you can speak a little bit more about the relationship between images and shadows, um, and especially in respect to, and what it means to the ontological status of the virtues, whether they are, they are themselves kind of like forms within us, or are they simply images of the forms? In, in one sentence. In one sentence. Sorry? Um, as shortly as possible, please. As, as shortly as possible. Okay, and, and to make it very short, uh, the, the difference is that uh, the, the, the notion of the, uh, the, the concept of image is much, much broader than that of the shadow. A uh, shadow is, work, only works for that thing, what, what is the skiographia arete, is only the outer appearance. Uh, I think Plato would not say the form of, of I don't know, a bravery in me or in you uh, is, an, is a shadow of the, the transcendent form of virtue, but you can actually use the, the, the concept of the image on that. And I think uh, what, what you uh, were, were um, saying uh, perfectly fits to what we have, for example, in the cave, because that the second level in the cave, these carried around the galmata, which, is, which are quite difficult, of course, they are images Images from that which is outside of the cave. He has this stony soa, and outside there are the, the, the soa themselves. And of course, this is an image relation. And of course, then we have to ask, what does it mean that this is an image relation? And we have to start to do that um, uh, in an ontological, let's say, more systematic question. But in that sense, the concept of image is much broader. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Thank you.